Okay, we are about to start. Let me just log just log into a um, into Sun Learn. <laughs> connecting, it's co connecting, it's failed. Oops. I wonder why it does that. It failed yesterday as well. Right. Um, oh, this isn't great. I was expecting hundreds of people. Okay, I'm getting a little. <coughs> Okay, fine. Here we go. Log in. I was I was going to say I don't leave. I don't like leave my sentences unfinished because it creates the impression that you know many people do that, and I just find it very. But I was going to say that uh, I'm getting a little annoyed, but never mind that. Um, yesterday seemed so far away. So, um, I don't need to do this, there's no need for you to know, but it is interesting stuff about the world. Uh, about this um, won't you guys oblige to these um, beats? Beats? Beats. Um, it is interesting to know. So, um, how does it go? Did you, did you like it? Better than last time. Just do get immediate feedback first. Please. Secondly, um, it seems to have increased the number of people who understand how the practice test works. Not to 100%. Um, so probably those people are probably not here, but there are people who send me emails often with saying that. I didn't finish the time, and I wanted to submit, but, but uh, I couldn't or didn't. But I mean, the whole point is that I'm trying to cut off. Anything over? Let's just have four people finished it, and the average grade was 67. And what else do you want to know? Uh, what's the median? That's kind of more important. 72. So half the class scored more than 72. Um, so I don't want to waste too much time on this, but half median is more important because averages can be skewed by distribution. If it slants it towards one side or slants it towards the other, the average is not very accurate. It may not be accurate. But uh, median is 72, so half the class scored above that. That's great news. So the practical test was easy. Oh, was it easy? Kind of. Okay. That's not really important. I can give you a plus easy test, or I can give you a really difficult test, and the only thing that's really important is for the test to be What's the difference between accurate and precise? Are those things the same concept? This is something that's neat, but I didn't know when I was supposed to have But I'll, I'll tell you. So imagine somebody throwing darts at a dartboard. Let's say they throw five um, darts, and they all hit in exactly the same spot at the edge of the dartboard. So that person is being very precise. But they're not accurate. So they're not supposed, they're supposed to hit the bull's eye in the middle, and they're not hitting that. So you can be precise, but you may not be accurate. Or you can be accurate, so you throw close to the middle, but you're not precise. You don't throw in the same spot all the time. 
The point of these tests is to be um, accurate. So we want to separate people who can program and has the skill from people who don't. Now, I also like it to be precise in the sense that it actually, um, maybe that's precise. In this context is a little more difficult. I'd like it to have many categories, so that there are people in the top category, in the next category, and all the way down. But if I only have two groups, that's fine. Can, some cannot. That's important to me because I have to assess you. Uh, and I'm in some sense assessing myself, am I a good teacher? But it's also important to you. The test is also normative. It tells you what is the norm. Am I performing okay or not? Oh man, this has got nothing to do with computer science. Let's just get back one a few steps. You found the test easy or peasy? Easy or though hard? Easy? Oh. Medium? Hard? Don't be shy. Unresponsive? Unresponsive? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, right. Um, this is the important part. Uh, we can look at these little figures, these little graphs. So these tell me we can calculate the statistics. And in fact, you should have written a little program about that. <laughs> statistics to, this, to, to check each of the questions to see does it separate the people who can program well from people who can program less well? How well does it distribute those two groups? Or how well does it make many groups in that range? So these little graphs tell me that the first question was actually the best. It separated out people who can program and who can't. And then the other questions were less successful, but anything above 40% is said to be, um, actually we should look at the green ones. This is how many people passed the test, the question. So almost everybody passed the first one. Um, second one, fewer people. Third one, fewer people. Last one. Fewer than 50%. But these green bars actually tell me how well the test separated people. So this first question seems to be the best. And then the last question was also good at separating people's current and current programs. In my other courses, when in the past when I've taught, I've used monkey puzzles for years and years and years. We always use these kinds of stats to find good questions that can weed people out. You probably don't want to know this, but I'm telling you for sake of transparency and openness, transformation at the university, sexual harassment, and all that stuff. <laughs> Keep it up to date. Now, um, I am not going to start section 4.4 today, as I kind of planned, because we kind of, not kind of, we simply have to catch up with what I haven't finished before. And I've come to the realization that we simply have to accept the fact that I'll be doing two sections of this textbook, if we're lucky. So 4.3, but 4.5, so 4.4 about maps and symbol tables. That's fine, we can live with that. Um, somewhere I have a secret illegal copy of this textbook. It's not illegal, I'm, I'm allowed to have one, but I may not be allowed to have this one. But never mind that. Um, there we go. And I'm using it uh, because if I try to hook up the camera, it won't show on YouTube. And today I'm actually recording on YouTube. It took me a while to figure out how to do that because I'm stupid. And because they've changed the whole system. So uh, they've changed the system. That's my excuse, at least. Okay. <coughs> So, where are we? I guess we're about page 400, okay. 500, 600. So this isn't as colorful, but never mind that. Um, let's go back, okay, fine. So let's just work through the chapter quickly once. So start of the chapter, it tells us what a stack is. We've done that many times. Then we talk about array implementation. There's array implementation, and we did that in class. That's easy peasy. That was exciting. But even more exciting was uh, test code. 
the linked list implementation for stacks. We started with stacks. And that was easy for stacks. And we also had a little node like this with an item and a next pointer. Then, very briefly, and here are nice little pictures of the linked list. And you should, you've seen this already because you read ahead. Um, linked list reversal. I'll skip that for now. A big example. And then I have a little section about array doubling. Do you remember we had that resize stack of strings? We had resize array stack of strings where as soon as the stack grew full, the array grew full, we doubled its size by making a new array and copying over everything, and that was fine. Now, here is something called amortized analysis. And you are growing up so fast, like it's typical for me, but um, <laughs> you are almost in the second year, and uh, we like to face the fact that when we write a computer program, we have to be concerned about how they perform. We can't just write programs. I mean, Code monkeys write programs. You write code. And it's fun to be a code monkey, but you don't want to be a code, code monkey all the time. We really want to make software, which is something bigger than just code. There's coding involved, but it's also about a bigger, higher level architecture. And one of the questions you have to address is how is this code, or this algorithm, or the system that I'm designing going to perform? Is it sensible to have um, one central server and loads of clients that connect it to some? With some module, um, and then connect it to one database because all the data needs to be combined. So then that server, of course, server has to handle all these clients. Or is it more sensible to have many different servers in different places and cl fewer clients that connect to each server, but I still need a central database, so now the poor database is going to handle all these different requests from the different server. So I have to decide Make decisions like that, design decisions about how my system is going to be, what's going to be the architecture of my system. That's at a high level. But at a little lower level, when we write code, we have to ask, how is this code going to perform? Is it going to be slowish? Am I using it once a day? It doesn't matter if it's slow. Am I using it 20 times every millisecond? It, it, it better be fast. It can't be order n squared if I'm going to have n equal to a million, and I'm using it 20 times a millisecond. So we have to think about how, what is our code's cost? And there are other costs of code. One of the things you must learn is how to bullshit. That means making things up on the fly. So I'm going to give you a little chance to practice. Um, let's start, I don't know, let's start with this column. At the back. What are the other costs of code? Um, I don't know. I don't expect you to know. I expect you to make it up. Yeah, I mean, oh, easy peasy. Okay, right. We have to be careful. But these days, random is so cheap. We don't even bother about that. But you're right. Please can explode. Let's see if it's spicy. The walking was for very, very slowly. Almost out. Another one. Right here, my chance to shout at students, let's face it, it's fun. Yes, space, of course, it shouldn't explode. You should be careful, but unless we are complete idiots, that probably won't happen. So you should be fine. Next, cost of code. I know this is nothing to do with 4.3, but you're learning something, so pay attention. Yes, cost of code. Well, you're fired. <laughs> I want people to use in bullshit. I want people to think things up on the fly, not them up even if they're false. What do you think the cost of code? What can it be? We've already talked about, I mean, when you write code, what do you have to think about? Space and time, yes. A volunteer. I need to say memory. You want to say memory, and we can, but unfortunately, someone else has already said it. <laughs> That won't work. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> uh, next. Oh, I, I'm okay. I, are we going to go through this whole morning alternating CPU and memory? <laughs> no, I'll tell you. People are chat. <laughs> why am I even? Why don't I even start this company? Oh. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, Curtis costs like how long will it take to write the code? 
if we have a super idea for code and it's going to be super fast and use super little memory, but it's going to take 10 years to write, and the clients will all be dead by then, it's not, it's not sensible to write it. And so cost, how long will it take to code the, the code to code? And that's important because we have to pay the salaries of our code companies. So, um, and the product needs to get to market, and our company has venture capital from these little shady Russian people that I used to start a company, and they're going to try to get the money back, and I'm going to be Nazi. Okay, so uh, what else? Next. Uh, Think along these lines. Yes. Uh, no, 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 no one in our company is smart enough to come up with a solution. I'm smart enough to do this. You can't possibly know this. I just thought I'd to see if it's something. Um, there's a cost to maintenance. We can write the code that's super fast and use super little memory, and we can do it quickly, so it's not going to take long. But if we ever want to maintain this code, it's going to be really ugly because the code is active, or it's difficult to understand. It's really difficult. The only one expert who is going to write the code for us has terminal cancer, no offense, but or is hit by a bus or something happens to it and you can't maintain the code. So code maintainability is another factor that you like to do. There are other things that are also important. Documentation. Come on, don't you should be considerate to other people, especially computer scientists. Okay, my whole point is that we need to think about these other things. It's, it's not, I don't want you to think that the whole of computer science will just be about hacking. And it's fun and I love doing it myself. I love writing little programs, making them lines, and all that stuff. But there are more things involved. And one of them is performance. You have to know, you have to be able to look at code and see is it, how long it will take to execute. And that's all so that we're not afraid all of that is just a preface so that we're not afraid of this word amortized analysis. But what it means is that we're analyzing the code. Amortized is just a fancy word for average to see um, what is the average cost. Because some operations may take longer sometimes, but other times they're faster. So we need to kind of look at the average. We can't just, operations won't have the same cost every single time. So let's talk about this. Actually, they're talking about doubling and halving strategy, but let's see about our all our implementations, the error implementation of the stack, what did it cost to push and pop? Order what? This won't be on the test, that may be more. I'll still have to think about it, and I know that this is not being recorded, sorry YouTube, but I'll tell you what I'm doing. Um, I'm writing on the board the four options you have on a monkey puzzle that you may or may not get it's the theory class i haven't decided yet but um order one that's constant time just like one operation or two or three k um order in actually i'll not write it i'll write log in i'm not sure if you did this but many data structures use login type, cross login type, you can see login memory, important. Order n, which is usually next. Then you must have done this, because you've done searching and sorting, and many sorting algorithms has time order n log n. Like quick sort, did you do quick sort? What sort did you do? What do you know? Merge sort, so excellent. So merge sort is n log n time. Often when something is recursive, you get a log n factor. And what else did you do? Insert the sort. Must have done that. That's the fifth option, order n squared. And then there's the sixth option. Okay, my monkey puzzle is not so many options, but let's just add it. Order two to the n. Really expensive. I want to avoid that. Is that true? No. Nothing I say is true. We gain everything, except that second. No, maybe that too. This is expensive, order 2 to the n. Sure, if n is a million, this will take forever. It will take longer than the age of the universe. If n is 0.1, then this is not expensive at all. 
and other things may be more expensive. So um, often we have a case where you only have small n plus, actually we can have an algorithm that's not 2 to the n, but let's say 1.3 to the n. There are loads of funny algorithms that are like this. 1.3 to the n. And for small n, this is really nothing. It's, it's not, it doesn't take too long. And we have another algorithm that's like 2 times n to the 4 plus 100 n plus 7. And that's much more expensive for small n than this exponential algorithm. So it's, it's more complicated than it looks. You must be, you have to keep your wits about you, you have to stay awake. Right here, anyway, so here are the options, six of them, order one, it's constant time, log n, order n, order n log n, n squared, or exponential. So, let's go. Um, pushing onto a stack in the array implementation, yes. Uh, what else? But it's more than just one operation. Isn't it? I mean, you put it in an array and you have to increment the character. <laughs> what kind of what kind of company do we have here? <coughs> and employees are like they're like I don't know, like the kind of ecstasy or something. Oh, really sad. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm telling you, it's a, the stupid boss is telling me that, but it's more than one operation. How can we order one? Shouldn't we order two? Come in, come in. Oh, sorry. You haven't missed what you haven't missed a lot. Sorry, what's your name? Taylor. What? Michaela? Taylor. Taylor? Mm -hmm. You know this? Yes, you would. I'm wondering what this is. Taylor, um, why is it not order two? Because there are two operations. I think. Jeez, you people, you suddenly I feel coldness in the class. It's, it's, you don't like this performance stuff, do you? Bad memories. Okay, all right. Never mind. We'll be over soon. It's two operations, really. I separate them out. So why should I order two? Okay. What do you want? Yeah, but the constant is two. <laughs> yes, I have two operations, one assignment and another assignment. Still assignment. Okay. Point is, we never write order two. We never <coughs> write order two or order three or order anything uh, except order one. And the reason for this is that the constants are factored out. The constants are factored out. We always take out the constants. For the same reason, we always write order n or order we never write no for order 2n. Even though there may actually be 2n operations at the end, 2n assignments or 2n if statements or what have you, um, we never write these constants in these big O notations because they're not really important. <coughs> if you optimize cleverly or if you um, buy a computer that's twice as fast, you can get rid of those constants. And let's not kid ourselves, computers are often, often become twice as fast. So it's not unrealistic. Merge law, I'm sure there was one slide about Merge law, at least. So we never write the constants in big O notation because they're not so important. Um, if n grows big enough, then it's much more important what the function is and not what the constants are. Of course, n doesn't always go really enough. Sometimes they only have small n. Our inputs will all be small n. But the point is that this is our mathematical analysis of algorithms. And this is a tool we are using. It's not perfect. And, but part of that tool is we always think about n growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And in that case, the constants are not important, and the shape of the function is much more important. Right here, let's move on a little quicker. Uh, popping from a stack in the error implementation. Okay, order one, Julio, someone else. What's your name? What's your name? Penny. Penny. I can't, I'm so sorry. So Penny. 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 
I, to me, it sounded exactly like pen. 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 Thank you. Cool. Um, what uh, list implementation, the linked list? Do you remember that? Were you in class? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> a little shock. Uh, <laughs> not because you were in class, but because anyone was in class. Um, adding a node to a linked list for the stack. Damn it! There's nothing but order one. Popping. Okay. Next, hoodie. I, I, sorry, I, um, I was waiting for your name, order name, but um, I, I'm just calling you hoodie. I, I'll learn your names tomorrow. So, hoodie. Um, 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 Arrow W. Push it. Hello, one. The... Well, yes. <laughs> you get half mark. But the computer doesn't assign half mark, so you get two. It's usually order one. So if we just add another element to the array, that'll be order one. But what happens in that special case where we have to double the size of the array. Is that also a good one? What is that? Yeah. You guys impress me. At least, I mean, or you guess it. But um, <laughs> no, in that case, it's on the end. Because let's say there are any elements in the stack right now. I have to allocate a new array that's double the size, but that's fine, that's all the one. But then I have to copy over each of the n elements. So I have a for loop that repeats n side times and copies all, an element from the old array to the new array. So that's all the n. So now this amortized analysis comes in because we need to find out um, what is the average. Well, let's think about it. Um, I, I don't like writing on the board because YouTube can't see it, but YouTube isn't here, so they don't mind so much. Um, the very first operation, let's say the size of the array was two. The very first operation is order one, because that's just adding one. Order one, now the stack is full. So the next one will be cost of two. And then now I've got a size four array. And three slots have been full. So I add one, that's order one. Yes. Sorry, what do you mean three? Because you're doubling and then you're adding one. Uh, uh, it will be n plus one. So it's kind of right because n is two. But, okay. Yeah, you're right. Let's make it. It's like doubling and adding one. Let's do that. That's good. Idea. Okay, three items in the stack. Fourth item, that's fine. Next item I want to add will cost me four plus one. Now the size is eight. And there are five items. So I can add three more. And then it will cost eight plus one. Now the size is 16. And there are nine items in the stack. And um, then I can add. Seven more, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then it'll cost 16 plus one, and it'll carry on like this. So how do I calculate the average of this whole thing? Well, it's kind of complicated, but what we can do is to say that this two, we can kind of distribute the this two cost to these two. And you can distribute this four cost to these four. Well, this two is gone. And this four is gone. And we can distribute this eight cost to these eight, the first eight. R to tau to the all this one plus eight is gone. And we can carry on like that. And now we have a situation where the first one will cost on average quite a lot, but then as things go on, they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. 
And we have to do some kind of advanced mathematics. I'm not sure if they have the full analysis here. No, we don't have any mathematics here. But um, you don't need to do the mathematics. You don't need to know the mathematics. The bottom line is that in the end, this whole thing will cost n over 2. So n over 2 and the big notation is n. But this is for um, a certain number of operations. This is after I've done so many operations. So if I average out again, I get back to order one. So this is kind of fantastic. Even though <coughs> even though I have to do all that extra work, all that in work from time to time. In the long run, in the very long run, if n just keeps growing and growing and growing, on average, the operations all cost all the n. I say all the one. So that I can use it. Sometimes it might be a little slower, but at the end of the day, the doubling array implementation <coughs> will be just as fast as just a regular array implementation. Of course, the regular one will run out of space, so I'll need to allocate an enormous error. But if I start with an enormous array, or I start with a small array, and I double each time I fill it up, basically, at the end of the day, the cost will be the same. And of course, the, the doubling one is therefore also roughly as fast as the linked list. There are some other hidden costs involved which we have not taken into account. And the fact is that when you forget about the copying of the array, when you make the array, that actually also costs something. It costs a little more than just one. Because the whole area has to be empty. Java does that. But um, even that is, is not going to change the fact that it's order n, order one. Okay, right here. So this is amortized analysis, and analysis of code is important. You don't have to do it all the time obsessively, but I can tell you that when I write code, I just write it and I relax, and then I run it, and then it goes really slowly. So I had we're doing research at the moment. About I do research with Professor Mansell sometimes, and we have his transcript. Did she mention the word automata at all? Or automata in class? She restrained herself from doing that because she tends to not be able to stop talking about that. <laughs> but um, we use these things called automata, the little graphs where things flow around, we calculate how it can flow, all kinds of stuff. And we have a particular problem we tried to solve, so I wrote a little program, a final program, and it started running. And then I had to calculate how long it will run. So I did this kind of analysis, and um, the answer for the program was just a number. But uh, it was clear that my first program was going to run at least for 10 years before the calculated that number. I now know the number is 30, but it would have taken my program uh, 10 years to calculate this. And then I improved it. So I went back and looked at my algorithms, data structure, and I tried to find out which ones were contributing with big costs like this. And so I fixed it, and now it only runs a year. And then things happen, and we improved it some more, and then it ran a few seconds. But the bottom line is that um, sometimes you have to think about these things, but that just uh, happen by themselves. Okay, so that's amortized analysis. Orphaned items. So they're, they're actually talking about garbage collection, as I know you've read the book and all that. And then they start talking about parameterized data types. So that's the whole story that we don't want to stack a string. We want a stack of anything. So we need to introduce generics to, um, to define our interfaces and the classes that implement them. So do you remember we had stuck a stack of item um, in class Wednesday? Um, so that, uh, what did we do? Where's the little code? So that we, ooh, can't highlight inside code boxes, but never mind. We also had a public class stack of item. And 
we go array way, and I told you that if you have a, a parameter like that, a generic called iterm, um, you can't make an array of iterms because Java doesn't allow that. And you can cheat a little bit, but you can still have a linked list. The linked list implementation works fine. It's just arrays that Java can't handle. So this is the linked list implementation from the book um, where they have a generic type of stack. This, yeah, I realized suddenly that it can be confusing. So let's see what we have. We have an uh, interface called, let's say, stack of strings, which is a contact about how a stack of strings can behave. And then we looked at the different implementations, array or linked list or doubling array. And now, so in some sense, the interface was an abstraction. It was a generalization <laughs> of the different implementations. Or well, something I could give to a client to say, here you go, you just use this, and I will worry about the implementation. And then we have a different kind of abstraction also, the second level of abstraction where we say, instead of having a stack of strings, I want a stack of items, any kind of item. And I have an interface that is an interface for a stack of items. And then for that interface, generic interface, I can also have a different implementation. I can use arrays if I cheat. I can use linked lists. So there are two levels of abstraction going on here. One is the interface that hides the implementation details. And one is this generic that hides the type of the stack even more. I just realized that, so I'm just telling you. Now, OK, 10 minutes to finish. I can do this. Stack applications. This book has a long section, which I am not going to go into um, in the rest of this course. And we look at other implementations of other things, but not of stats. But they have a long implementation, uh, application part, that is actually quite fascinating. And it's hard to be just work, how Java works. If you have an expression like this, one plus, oh, bracket one plus bracket bracket two plus three bracket times bracket four times five bracket bracket bracket. How does the computer know that the multiplication must happen first and the addition must happen second? Well, it, it knows because we coded to know that. But how does it actually do that? If it just, it's just reading an, uh, um, an expression from left to right, how does it know that it needs to wait when it sees the plus sign? It needs to wait until it's seen the multiplication. How does it do that? And the answer is it uses a stack. Every time it reads one of those symbols, it puts it on a stack where it waits. And then when it's finished a whole expression, when it reaches the close bracket, it pops things off the stack where they're waiting and say, OK, I've seen the close bracket. I can now take things off the stack and do the operation. So it'll put the one on the stack and the plus on the stack. It'll go up to the two, put that on the stack, put the three on the stack, plus between them. And then when it sees this first close bracket, it says, ah, oh, I've just seen the close bracket for the last operation, so the two and the three. So I can take them off the stack, two plus three, do the calculation, that's five, and then five goes back on the stack. So every time you see a close bracket, you're going to do a lot of pops, and these open brackets well, they kind of push a slot, but they're not really. Um, let's see. Well, here it explains the whole thing. Push operands onto the stack. Push operators onto well, diff two different stacks. Ignore left parentheses, because we're already pushing the operands and the operators. And when you encounter a right parentheses, then you pop things off the stacks. OK. And there's actually code to, to evaluate expressions like this. So you. Um, Run this program, you type an expression like that, and it'll calculate the answer. All done with stacks, I promise you. There we go. A stack of string, a stack of double. It's a miracle. And you can read it all in the weekend. It's going to be exciting. Uh, push, push. Oh, the detail is killing me. OK. Right. FIFO queues. So then we move on to queues. In fact, I keep running. 
first and so really. What can you do with queues? So we've looked at every, uh, actually I told you, I'll show you a picture of how queue looks inside and we'll get to that. But let me just get to the application before that goes away, out of my mind. Do we use queues at all? Did you use a queue in your project? You said that. Why, why don't you use that queue for? Well, you're going to say breadth first serve, consensus. Consensus attention in the room, breadth first serve. But um, that's not really true. Because um, breadth first search is just a way of, it's what you really want it to do. But to do that, what you did instead is use a queue to, to do what is called, um, it was basically a work queue. So as you search, you generate work, that went into a queue. And your whole search was driven by saying, is there any work to be done in the queue? Yes, there is. Take the first work item, process it using bread first search, which generated more work, um, and throw it away. So your basic loop was not, I mean, of course it was bread first search, but your basic work, uh, um, a loop in your project, you, I suppose, was make a queue, put the very first item in the queue, the very first state of the puzzle, and then, while there's still some work to be done in the queue, take the first item, process it, maybe adding new work, new nodes, new board positions to the queue, and throw it away. So all you were doing was really put the first thing in the, in the queue, and then, it, then you go off and say, is the queue empty? No. Take the first item, do work, throw it away. Take the, take the next item, do the work, throw it away. Take the next item, do the work, throw it away. Do the work to produce more work for the team. This paradigm, this idiom, this way of coding or high-level idea of coding is really very, very common. Predator um, search is really common, it's used all over, but even more common is to use queues to do simulations. If you think about a simulation, let's say I ask you to simulate all the traffic in Salamash. What are you going to do? It would be wrong to create an enormous array that presents all the squares in Stellenbosch and have some of the square few roads and other square few buildings and then to simulate the cars in each square and how they move on the way. So that's the first approach maybe and maybe naive students will do it that way but I know that you are much more clever and, and subtle in your programming skill. So you're going to say that, well, I am rather going to think of a car moving as a little piece of work. I'm going to use a work queue, and at the start, I'm going to put all the cars into the work queue. And then I'm going to carry on the following operation. Take the first car from the queue, the one who has to move next, move it a little bit, and put it back in the queue. So I'm not going to keep a big array that stores which cars are where. All I'm going to do is I'm going to store one record, one instance of a car class, a car object, and I'm going, that object is going to store the position of the car, and I'm going to update that object from time to time. And my list, my queue of cars to update will be my queue. I'll take one from the front, update the car, put it in the back. Often we also do not want to make a hundred cars right at the start. So we have something else called, that I will call a car gun. Somewhere in Salabash, because your simulation is going to be down So cars are going to flow into Salabash from Somerset West and Dowell, all kinds of places. How do, how do we simulate that? Well, we have a few car guns. And a car gun is also a work item. It goes in our queue. And when I get to a car gun, the work I do for a car gun is to fire a new car into the system. So I'm going to have something I call a car gun. To do the work for the car gun, all it does is to say, make a new car, add it to my work queue, and take this car gun and also add that to the back of the queue. So now I've just produced a new car. The, car, the gun has fired a new car into my queue, into my simulation. And 
When that car reaches the front of the queue, I will update its position. It's traveling around in my system. And the car gun is also in the queue. It will fire another additional car into the queue. How many minutes do I have left? Six. Oh, it's not really accurate. So that is the concept of simulation. We use it all the time. We use it to simulate loads of stuff. We use it to simulate traffic. Real traffic simulations is done with this queue idea, this queuing idea. And then they usually call it the screen event simulation. You don't need to know those words. Um, we use exactly the same idea in state-of-the-art programs. We simulate network on the internet, or traffic on the internet, um, other kinds of networks where, for example, a network inside your computer, where the memory needs to talk to the CPU, it needs to talk to the disk, with information coming in from the keyboard. When we do those kinds of simulations, when the engineers build computers and do those simulations, they use the same concepts. We use this for um, things like simulating um, Bitcoin transactions, supermarket performance. Oh, some wake up. Do you need to go? No, you've got loads of time. We've got hours, five minutes, right. So this whole section is actually quite quite advanced mathematics, but that's just a formula that tells you what is the waiting time for someone in the queue. And I think the simulation may be about supermarkets or something like that. But um, we're not going to work through it. I'm just telling you that this is the queue um, application, uh, an application of queues. And the whole point of this little program is to draw graphs like that to show that if you have a queue where people join at this rate, 1.67, let's say, per second, but uh, actually the waiting time is 0.25 seconds, then this will be the length of the queue. It'll start out and grow quite full, but eventually it'll just calm down. It'll grow empty. That's what I want to see in my supermarket. Um, this one works a little differently a little faster, they spend less time in the queue, and I guess there should also be bad situations, but maybe not. So I'm going to stop. On Monday, I promised last time I mentioned Saxon Queue for now. I'm just going to show you my this picture there, which I haven't shown here. Plus, uh, we have to talk about these things it's called iterators. They're quite important, they're all over Java, and it's a nice concept to know. And then we'll start, start talking about maps and symbol tables. OK, so thanks, guys. Uh, let's see if I can stop the broadcast.